Okay, great. So today we have Teddy uh, from UIC to uh, tell us something about uh, relatively geometric actions on Cat0 cube complex. Are you able to say? Yeah, yeah, give me one second. There we go. Just okay, trying to get my, my iPad working there. All right, thanks again for inviting me to speak again this week. Uh, this is talk number two, so I'll try to give some pointers to remind you of things that we talked about last week whenever I'm assuming you know things. Um, but for the most part, uh, I think you should be able to keep up uh, if you didn't pay attention last week. Uh, so I'm going to talk about relatively geometric actions on cat zero cube complexes. So this is sort of what the, one of the main projects that I've been working on. Uh, this is joint work with Daniel Groves, who's also at UIC. So sort of to give you an outline of what I'll talk about today, um, I'll first start with a bit of background about groups that are acting on cat zero cube complexes. So we talked a little bit about that at the very end last time. So I'll sort of speed you up. And there are a couple bits of sort of unfinished business from last week that uh, we figured out in the last week. So I'll touch on those quickly. Then I'll sort of switch gears and talk about Dane filling, uh, relatively, high uh, relatively hyperbolic Dane, group theoretic Dane filling. Um, and how this sort of makes relatively geometric actions on cat zero cube complex a natural way to sort of build actions of relatively hyperbolic groups. So in the background, I'll talk a bit about sort of some of the great things that have been done for hyperbolic groups acting on cat zero cube complexes. And this is going to be some sort of new kind of action of a relatively hyperbolic group on a cat zero cube complex that we hope is sort of somewhat natural. And sort of Dane filling is gonna be one of the main tools that we use to to see that this is actually sort of a natural idea that we might want to investigate further. Um, so I'll have introduced these actions, um, but then you might ask, well, how am I actually going to make such an action? So I'll talk a little bit about how you construct these relatively geometric actions and where they would arise. And if you'll recall last time, I briefly mentioned sort of this Bergeron-wise criterion for constructing actions of a proper and co-compact actions of a hyperbolic group on a cat zero cube complex. And I'll sort of give a analog of that for constructing these so-called relatively geometric actions, which are unfortunately not proper and co-compact, but they are going to be have sort of some weakened, they will be co-compact, but not proper. Um, I'll talk a little bit about one of the potential applications we have in mind, which is to the relative canon conjecture. And this should sort of tie in nicely to probably some of the things that uh, Peter Hysinski is going to talk about next week since this sort of builds on some, some work that he's done in the hyperbolic setting. Um, and then as time permits at the end, I'll sort of talk about some of the longer term goals we have for this project and, and things that we might also anticipate you could do with relatively geometric actions. In particular, this application to the Ken conjecture you know, sort of leads you to naturally want to be able to maybe make some effort to classify which kinds of groups actually admit these actions. And I'll talk about sort of some ways that we can generalize uh, machinery from the hyperbolic setting to this general, more general relatively hyperbolic setting. All right, so without further ado, I should mention the, the two cleanup items that I promised I would talk about. So last week, somebody asked what happens when you take a, a group, let, so let's let G be a hyperbolic and suppose G has totally disconnected boundary. <clears throat> and somebody asked, I think, whether you could determine that uh, whether this group acts properly and co-compactly on a cat zero cube complex. And after talking about this a bit with Joe, um, we discovered that you actually don't even need the Bergeron-Weiss criteria. And you can basically do something where if you use sort of Stallings, plus work of Dunwoody, you can get that this group G will split as, um, as a finite graph of groups. And this is going to be over finite edge groups, where vertex groups are at most one-ended. And so once you have this splitting, um, this is a splitting over finite edge groups, which in particular are quasi-convex in the, oh, did I say that G is hyperbolic? 
yeah, so G is hyperbolic. And the reason you can get this splitting in part requires that if you're hyperbolic, then you're finitely presented. Um, and that's why you get this, this particular splitting. And once the vertex groups are at most one-ended, the vertex groups QI embed. So if there's totally disconnected boundary and these vertex groups are at most one-ended and they're hyperbolic, then they in fact have to be finite. So that implies the vertex groups are finite. So now you have a proper and co-compact action on the bass serre tree because the vertex groups are finite. And so that's your proper and co-compact action on the cat zero cube complex, <laughs> which is in fact just a tree. So thanks to Joe, he helped me out a good bit with or it was helpful to have somebody bounce the ideas back and forth on as to exactly how you would do this. Um, and uh, the one other thing that I want to just clear up was that um, I mentioned this result, which will come up again. So um, said that, um, so this was a theorem due to Charney and Crisp. And we had G finitely generated and G acts discontinuously. So what that means in this context, is, I was asked what that means in this context, that means that the orbits are discrete. So each of the points, when you take its orbit, it should be a discrete set inside of this new space X that we're working in, which I haven't defined yet. So I want this to be acting discontinuously, meaning the orbits are discrete, co-compactly and by isometries on the length space X. then there should exist a finite collection P of maximal isotropy subgroups. So in all the cases we'll be working in, these are going to be sort of maximal cell stabilizers because you're going to have some kind of combinatorial structure since these are going to be cube complexes. Um, so there's going to be a finite collection of, and I lied, I should say conjugacy representatives of, of um, maximal cell stabilizers. And then X is going to be QI to the coned off Cayley graph. Of G um, with respect to P and some generating set. Um, in particular, we'll be looking at sort of a case, we'll see that this comes up naturally in the relatively geometric setting where our maximal isotropy subgroups will be peripheral subgroups of this relatively hyperbolic group. And then you'll get a correspondence between this nice coned off Cayley graph that witnesses the relatively hyperbolic geometry of your group and this Q complex that you're acting on. In particular, that will tell you through this quasi isometry that because you had the you had a relatively hyperbolic group, the coned off Cayley graph is hyperbolic, then this cube complex that you're acting on is also going to be delta hyperbolic for some delta because it's QI to a hyperbolic space. So that's where this this will become useful. All right, so um, so for those of you, I think I may have mentioned what a cat zero cube complex, if you're not familiar with it, it it's not that important to this particular setting, um, but basically a cube complex is something that is built out of Euclidean cubes and they're glued together along faces. And then it's going to be cat zero if it satisfies some sort of local non-positive curvature condition and it's simply connected. So you should think of this as sort of some, some cube complex that's the universal cover of some quotient um, and that it sort of admits some non-positive metric on it or non-positively curved metric on it. So why people have sort of studied it, this in the past, so theorem, theorem one, and this is due to Agle. Um, let's let G be a hyperbolic group 
And if G acts properly and co-compactly on X twiddle, a cat zero cube complex, then G is so-called virtually special. So if I told you approximately nothing, if you don't know what virtually special is, the sort of short version of, of virtually special, it means that there exists a finite index G prime contained in G so that if we take the X prime mod G twiddle, you're going to get this nice immersion into the Salvetti complex of a right angle Orton group. Okay, if you've seen this before, great. If not, I'm not really telling you very much still, but sort of what you should think of if you haven't seen this before, the Salvetti complex of a rag is sort of this very nice complex and right angled Artin groups are nice and you get that you that this nice immersion carries sort of a, a group embedding of G prime into the Salvetti complex of a rag. And it basically tells you that you get this group suddenly has nice residual properties. And you can sort of see that it's, um, for example, residually finite and further sort of the quasi convex subgroups of G prime are going to have sort of very nice properties as related to the geometry. You can do things like take things that are carried by um, quasi convex subgroups and you can sort of geometrically visualize them and embed them in some finite cover of X twiddle mod G prime. So there's a lot of sort of very nice natural things. This figured really prominently in Eagle's proof of the virtual Hawking conjecture. So this actually turns out to be sort of one of the, the key things in studying the actions of cat zero cube complex groups on cat zero cube complexes, because you can sort of get these nice actions. And so one of the natural questions is, is can you do something like this for relatively hyperbolic groups? Can you generalize this machinery? And can you sort of capture virtual specialness? So I'll talk a little bit more about some of the the ways that you could um, try to extend this to relatively hyperbolic groups, but it's not immediately sort of necessarily obvious that trying to get proper and co-compact actions of relatively hyperbolic groups on cat zero cube complexes is necessarily the right thing to do. Um, sorry, quick question. Uh, um, maybe you're gonna do something that, like this later, but is there an example we should have in mind um, uh, from your uh, above, if you could scroll up a, a little oh, bit. Yeah, sorry. Um, of a of a you know one of these discontinuous but not properly discontinuous actions where you see these p uh, subgroups appearing. Uh, let me hold off on that. How would I? What would give you take like so? Um, what's a really natural, obvious situation? Take like. Um, a finite graph of groups where you have infinite vertex groups and over say finite groups, then you know, you'll get some action on the Vassar tree and you'll be hyperbolic relative to the vertex stabilizers. Um, I see. So the so the orbits there are discrete, but then but sometimes but sometimes there's infinite stabilizer. That's Is right. That the, the point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's okay. the point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so sort of one of the things that we're going to, to head towards is that you know, it's not necessarily easy in the proper and in the hyperbolic setting, there's this Bergeron Wise criterion that I talked about last week that lets you relatively easily build proper and co-compact actions on cat zero cube complexes. But when your group is not hyperbolic, it's not necessarily easy to build these actions. And so one of the sort of natural things as well, can you water down proper or co-compact and maybe get some, some theory that's somewhat more useful. Um, okay, so um, another theorem that I should just sort of mention because it's a, a big, big useful thing in sort of understanding how these groups arise and how do you get virtual specialness is uh, Wise's quasi-convex hierarchy theorem. Which, and it characterizes uh, 
Right, this is virtual specialness. Um, oops. Characterize virtual specialness for hyperbolic groups. Uh, in terms of, of so-called nice iterated splittings over HNN extensions and amalgams. So basically, if you have a, what Weiss proved is that if you have one of these virtual, virtual these special groups, that you can basically split it and eventually over quasi-convex subgroups doing either HNN extensions and um, amalgams, and eventually you'll end up with something that is finite groups at the end. So you, and vice versa, if you can build something up by sort of amalgamating or doing HNN extensions over quasi-convex subgroups, you'll get something that's virtually special. And so we'll talk a little bit about how you might aim to deal with this in this new relatively geometric setting. Uh, so now, of course, what you would ask is, well, how could I sort of take the magic of being able to do this with hyperbolic groups and then apply it to the wider class of relatively hyperbolic groups where we might be able to incorporate some of the important ideas from hyperbolic geometry that were used to prove these things. So some, some sort of attempts to generalize. So one is um, Wise's work on finite volume hyperbolic three manifold groups. So even when they're not closed, it turns out that they act properly in Kokenbackley on a cat zero cube complex. Um, there's been some work by Oregon Reyes to give um, a relatively hyperbolic version of, um, of the theorem above, Weiss's quasi-convex hierarchy theorem. Um, and this builds on one of the directions of this, builds on my thesis. Um, there's been some work for, by Hruska Wise and others to study so-called proper co-sparse actions. So this is where you're sort of thinking of, well, I have this sort of proper co-compact part of my action, but then I might have these sort of wild areas where the action is proper, but there's sort of these cusp type things hanging off. So you have a bunch of these free abelian subgroups where this action is no longer co-compact. Uh, and then another spot where this has been worked on a bit is this paper of Shu and Weiss and Ventionis about cubulating malnormal amalgams, which aims to show that sort of if you take some nice amalgams over relatively quasi-convex subgroups of things that are cubulated, so things that act properly and compactly on cat zero cube complex, you want to say amalgamate them or take HNN extensions, and you want to get them to be uh, acting on a cat zero cube complex that's sort of part of the quasi-convex, what's in the quasi-convex hierarchy theorem. But for relatively hyperbolic groups, this is much harder to do. And in this Shu and Weiss paper, they have to put very strong restrictions on the subgroups that you're amalgamating over. So in particular, like you want to know whether A star C B acts on a cat zero. Why is my iPad not moving? Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, so, does A star B act on a cat zero cube complex when A and B act on a cat zero cube complex? And so in the Shu and Wise paper, they give some sort of ideas of how you would do this when this amalgam is relatively hyperbolic and C is malnormal and obeys a bunch of other, malnormal relatively quasi-convex and obeys a bunch of other fairly onerous restrictions. 
All right, so our proposed solution to this is to build these new relatively geometric actions where instead of doing what the proper co-sparse people do where they have actions that are proper but not co-compact, we'll have actions that are co-compact but not proper. So before I introduce the key definition, let me just write down some standing assumptions so that I don't accidentally misstate things. So let's assume that uh, G, P, is a relatively hyperbolic pair. And let's assume that X twiddle is a cat zero cube complex. And we'll also assume that that uh, P contains residually finite peripherals. This is a fairly mild assumption, but um, for Dane filling, you'll be absolutely screwed if your peripherals are not residually finite. Um, so that, that's somewhat important. So right, what does this mean? This means every group inside the collection P is residually finite? That's right, yeah. Okay. All right, so here's the what we propose as sort of an interesting class of groups. So we'll say if G acts by isometries on X twiddle, um, we say the action of G on X twiddle is relatively geometric. when first condition is the action of G on X twiddle has co-compact quotient. Uh, to every infinite Self stabilizer is conjugate to a finite index subgroup of um, some P and P. I guess now I should write that out properly because that's not quite right. Finite subgroup of some P and P. So Namely, I don't mean that there's one peripheral that contains all the stabilizers of the finite index subgroup, but there should be um, that every infinite cell stabilizer should be conjugate into some peripheral subgroup. And three, I want that every P in this collection, every peripheral subgroup acts, acts elliptically. So it should fix a point or it should be a cell stabilizer. Um, in particular, if you want sort of a example zero, take the example that I gave a couple minutes ago where you have some bass air tree or you have a finite graph of groups and then you have the relatively hyperbolic structure where it's hyperbolic relative to the vertices. So you have this action, you have a compact quotient and then your stabilizers are all sort of very limited in terms of what they could possibly be. All right, so what, what this should say, in particular, the, the theorem above, but from Charney and Crisp, should say that um, X twiddle is QI to the hyperbolic, the, I should say, it's QI to the coned off Cayley graph or G, P, and in particular that X twiddle is now hyperbolic because the coned off Cayley graph for a relatively hyperbolic group is hyperbolic, so X twiddle must be hyperbolic as well. All right, so why is this natural? So we can use uh, relatively hyperbolic Dane filling to do some really magic stuff so that we can actually relate this group now to the situation where you have a 
group acting, a hyperbolic group acting on a cat zero cube complex. And you can sort of pull back some of the Eagle wise machinery in a very natural way. So to take a slight detour, Dane filling is this tool that lets you do the following. So I think this was originally introduced by, um, at least in the, the relatively hyperbolic situation, some of the earliest, I think, is to Damani, Girardel, and Ozen. Um, and there's quite a bit of work as well by Groves and Manning. So if you take this collection, P equals P1, P2, up to PK, as before, so I'm going to just enumerate out what my peripheral subgroups are, or at least representatives for them. A peripherally finite Dane filling is going to be a quotient um, G to G mod K, where K equals the normal closure of some collection of subgroups, Ni, where Ni is uh, are a collection of subgroups where each Ni is contained in Pi, and I want them to be finite index. So, sort of an example of how you would think this this kind of thing would relate to the classical Dane filling, where you have sort of finite volume hyperbolic three manifold, and you want to fill in the torus cusps by gluing in the solid torus. This is basically what you're doing. You're doing a group theoretic analog of this, where you're sort of gluing in some finite index thing into the cup. You're making some finite index gluing of the solid torus into this. Um, I guess it's not quite analogous, but you're basically closing off the cusps here. And so you go from being relatively hyperbolic to having something that's hyperbolic because you've now filled in the cusp subgroups. So here's the really magic theorem that makes this work perfectly well. And this is due to Groves and Manning. I think it appears in their paper called Hyperbolic Groups Acting Improperly. And this is kind of unbelievable when you first read it. So if you take GP and it acts relatively geometrically on X twiddle. So this is a much more, this can be stated in much more generality, but I'm just stating it for the particular situation we'll be working in. Then there exists a peripherally finite Dane filling so I can fill this in this group that I started with but the really surprising thing that you get is that when you take the quotient of the cat zero cube complex that you have a relatively geometric action on by the kernel of this filling you remain in the category of cat zero cube complexes So in particular, what you have is that you have, um, you have that, that G mod K is hyperbolic acting on a cat zero cube complex. And by Agel, um, G mod K is virtually special. And so what I should say is that this, this immediately should tell you that in some ways this is a very natural perspective because now when you have a group acting relatively geometrically, you can descend to this quotient, use the nice residual properties of virtual specialness, and you can maintain enough control over this Dane filling by sort of taking what we call a sufficiently long Dane filling and sort of if you glue in enough stuff, but you leave little bits of it out in a controllable way, that you can actually pull back a lot of the residual properties of being virtually special to your group that's acting relatively geometrically. And at the end, I might talk about sort of how you can use some of the tools that you would get for virtually special cube complexes and how you can apply this to the relatively geometric setting. But to just give you sort of one 
slight immediate other way that you can see that this might be useful is that, in fact, this action of G on X twiddle, this is topologically, topologically this quotient is the same as, as this. Um, is that, do I have things exactly the right direction? No, I have the wrong thing. So topologically they're the same, of course, when you take X twiddle mod G, then you have some nasty complexes of group structure that's left over. But it turns out that you can actually clean this up a little bit further. So in particular, what, one of the things we can say is that from this, um, there exists a finite index G naught. So in the same situation as above, there's a finite index subgroup G naught contained in G. So that the underlying cube complex um, of X twiddle mod G naught is special. So basically you have this nice geometric space that your complex of groups, so G naught mod X twiddle is unfortunately going to be some kind of complex of groups because the stabilizers are no longer, the stabilizers are no longer trivial. You now have some sort of infinite stabilizers that you have to account for. But so the underlying cube complex is special and you can sort of hope to do some of the nice tricks that they do like canonical completion in this particular setting using the fact that you're working over a special cube complex. So there's some kind of nifty stuff that you can do. Another thing that I'd like to highlight is that um, by passing to, to G naught, um, the action of G naught on X twiddle uh, has cell stabilizers that are maximal parabolic or trivial. So when I first wrote down relatively geometric actions, I made the stipulation that you only had to be commensurable into one of the peripheral subgroups if you wanted to be a vertex stabilizer. Whereas here, I'm actually saying that by sort of getting rid of all torsion and passing to finite index covers and doing nice stuff, that you can actually basically either have your cell stabilizers be one of the maximal parabolics, so conjugate to one of the peripheral subgroups, or it's just trivial. There's no stabilizers. So you can get rid of all the finite stabilizers. You can stop worrying about finite index. So this is like a, when you're working with complexes of groups, everything you can do to sort of simpl simplify the structure of the stabilizers is welcome. In particular, this says that if you have two adjacent vertex stabilizers, their intersection has to be, they either have to agree and then the edge stabilizer between them is exactly what the vertex stabilizers are, or the vertex stabilizers are different and then the edge stabilizer is trivial because parabolic subgroups intersect in um, finite things if they're distinct, but in this case, there are no finite stabilizers, so it's trivial. Um, could you give an example how this, uh, these theorems work? Like um, maybe in the case that you mentioned where we have a group acting on a tree? So let's see. So unfortunately in the case where the group is acting on the tree uh, like that, you already have what you want because, um, well, what should happen? Um, you can basically pass to a finite index subgroup, then you can get rid of any possible edge stabilizer that's in between them. But you might have to pass to something finite index and nasty. Um, so yeah, that sounds right. And then, um, but you already had things that were, your stabilized, cell stabilized were already maximal parabolic. How does the group K look like in that case, or maybe the quotient G mod K? Um, 
what does the group look like? That's hard. To, I think that's pretty hard to say because you know, you take some the sort of magic of the Dane filling machinery is that you can sort of just write down some finite index, write down sort of a collection of fairly generic finite index subgroups of your peripherals. Mm -hmm. And then you just take the normal closure. And then the, you sort of don't really have much idea of what the normal closure looks like, but you sort of can say that, um, what, what can you say? Um, Things that you can do sort of like, say you have what, what the kind of control that I can offer you over what that looks like is say I take some element that's outside of any of these filling kernels. Mm -hmm. So if I take some element of your group and it doesn't belong to any of these NIs, yeah. then I can pass to sufficiently finite, or sorry, if it doesn't belong to any of the peripheral subgroups, that's what I should say. I can find some finite index collection of subgroups of that so that I can make sure that even after I pass to this Dane filling, that element will survive the Dane filling. So it doesn't go to something trivial. Okay. So um, wait, how, how, how is this guaranteed? Um, uh, that's hard. Okay. <laughs> that's not, hard. Not part so of that, the that, statement or? Uh, that's, like, that's like part of the, that would be part of like the fundamental theorem of, of Dane filling and like you should look at one of the okay. papers by Groves and Manning yeah. or by um, okay. By yeah, sure. I, I roughly remember that part, but I, yeah, <laughs> I don't but, see it from the theorem, so I was a bit confused. I, I was worried that maybe the quotient you mark cake would be trivial or something. No, no. So this okay. is like a you can do all kinds of control over this. You can take sort of sufficiently long Dane fillings, and if you have some finite list of elements that are outside of the peripherals that you want to look after, you can control what happens to them in the quotient. Okay. In particular, you can sort of make arguments like if I want to do this element, then I do this filling, or if I want to do this element, then I can do this filling and find things out based on the fact that as long as I fill it in a particular way, the filling is still going to give me something nice down below. Yep. Yep. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So that is actually a good subtle point though, because you know, you you need to be a little bit careful because you want to do things like completions and whatnot, but you sort of lose a bit of the canonical aspect because you may have to do sort of the fillings based on what you're asking questions about. And then you might need to do this filling and then, or do that filling. Yep. So, Great. so it is a little bit tricky. Yep. Thanks. Okay. So um, I told you now that you, that these things, I've defined these things for you, but you should always be suspicious when somebody writes down a bunch of definitions for you and then doesn't actually tell you how to, how you would encounter one of these things. I guess I gave you a, a primitive example, but let's see, how do you construct uh, relatively geometric actions? Um, so one thing I just need to introduce on the side because this is somewhat important to the theory. So if I take some subgroup H and it's contained in G, um, H is going to be so-called full if for all P in P um, and G in the group, HG intersect P is finite or finite index in P. So what you don't want, what you, this is just sort of avoiding the pathology where what could happen is that you don't want subgroups are full when you have some peripheral subgroup and you don't want to kind of slice one of the parabolic subgroups. You want to make sure that if you have some sort of infinite intersection, uh, if you have an infinite intersection with a parabolic, you're going to swallow up almost all of that parabolic. So the, the quintessential example is what you don't want to have happen is like, if you have like a Z squared representing cusp subgroup, you don't want to have sort of one of these diagonal cyclic, infinite cyclic groups coming through it. And that's not going to really play nicely with the relatively hyperbolic geometry. So here's the 
the theorem for how you construct such an action. So let's suppose the elements of P are all one ended. And let's suppose for all points U and V in the Bowditch boundary with respect to P, uh, there exists a full relatively quasi-convex subgroup. Um, H so that G oh so that sorry so that lambda H separates U and V into H distinct components of the Bowditch boundary. Um, then there exist finitely many full relatively quasi-convex subgroups of G so that uh, G acts relatively geometrically on the dual cube complex. So this is sort of a mouthful, but it, let me draw you kind of the cartoon version of what's going on here. Here's your Bowditch boundary. So to just remind you what the Bowditch boundary was, last week I said that you can, if you have a relatively hyperbolic group, you want it to act on, you can get it so that it acts properly on some delta hyperbolic space. And if you take the boundary of that, then you get the Bowditch boundary. Unfortunately, this is not the visual boundary of the coned off Cayley graph. Rather, it looks more like the visual boundary of the coned off Cayley graph, plus you throw in one point for each of the parabolic points, and then you have to put a topology on it, um, which I mentioned briefly last time. And so what you want is you want sort of if you take two points in the boundary, what I want to make sure is that I can sort of cut the boundary into different components by some subgroup H here. And then I want to make sure that H doesn't necessarily take the component taking U to the component containing V. Um, sort of a, one canonical example you can imagine is like if I have, here's sort of a, a bad example that doesn't give the right context exactly. Uh, no, that's not the right thing. But that's going to be very bad. But if I take sort of here's my hyperbolic space, and here's my here's sort of point one in the boundary U and V, and say they're connected by some bi infinite geodesic, you'll want to slice this bi infinite geodesic by some subgroup into sort of two different pieces, and you want to make sure that you can't switch the sides of the bi infinite geodesic. That's sort of the, the geometric idea of what's going on. Another way place you could see this is sort of if you had an action on a cat zero cube complex, which is not really helpful to begin with, and say it was a hyperbolic group acting on a cat zero cube complex. Um, if you took one of the hyperplanes that cuts the bi infinite geodesic connecting the two points on the boundary, that would be sort of your example of some quasi convex subgroup. Of course, if you cubulate over the hyperplanes of a cat zero cube complex that a hyperbolic group is acting on properly and co-compactly, you'll get the same cat zero cube complex back. So that's not really useful, but that's sort of the, the geometric inspiration for why this, this might be sort of the natural thing to do. All right, so let me give you some, some slightly non-trivial examples of, well, actually quite non-trivial examples of how you would how you would actually use this fact in nature. So Let's let G, for example, be pi one of a finite volume, volume hyperbolic, uh, finite volume hyperbolic three manifold. And in the closed case, you can use Kahn Markovich to produce these surfaces that will give you this efficient collection of 
full relatively quasi-convex subgroups. Of course, when you're hyperbolic and you're closed, you're hyperbolic, so you want to take the trivial peripheral structure. Um, but you get these Kahn-Markovich surfaces, and then you can use the Bergeron-Weiss criterion or this criterion in sort of a trivial version. Or in the not closed case, so as I mentioned, this is somewhat moot because Weiss had proved in the, Weiss has already proved that these groups are properly and co-compactly cubulated, but you can show that um, that if you have a non-closed finite volume hyperbolic three manifold, you also can construct a relatively geometric action by doing the following. You take these ubiquitous quasi Fuchsian surfaces. So Cooper and Feuder sort of show that you can take points in the boundary and you can sort of, there's lots and lots of these quasi Fuchsian surfaces and you can separate points in the boundary using these quasi Fuchsian surfaces. And that gives you your supply of full relatively quasi convex subgroups that you can cubulate over to get a relatively geometric action. Um, in particular, you should note it's kind of not an obvious question that you might ask, well, what's the difference? And it's not obvious that just because a group acts properly and co-compactly on a cat zero cube complex, whether it also admits a relatively geometric action because proper and co-compact actions are not relatively geometric because in particular, if you wanna be relatively geometric, you're required to have points to infinite point stabilizers, which are the peripheral subgroups. Unless of course you're, you have a hyperbolic group where you have a, a set of finite peripheral subgroups. Um, but to get a relatively geometric action, you have to have sort of interesting stabilizers. And this is also useful because then you do get this stain filling type argument that you can do. So this is a little bit different. So one of the conjectures that we haven't quite proved yet, but we conjecture that relatively geometric actions generalize um, generalize proper co-compact actions. Um, in particular, if G acts properly, and co if GP acts properly and co-compactly on a cat zero cube complex, then it will also act relatively geometrically on some other cat zero cube complex. Uh, oh. I, had a, I had a question. Uh, sure. The, is that, are, the, are these quasi-Fuchsian surfaces, are they full? Do they give full subgroups? I, I thought the picture I had, what you were saying is that you don't want to have slices. I'm picturing the surface as, you know, intersecting the, the cusp boundary, the toral cusp boundaries in, in Z subgroups. I thought that's what you're trying to avoid. I think you can arrange them. I'm probably not qualified to exactly answer this question at the moment, but I think you can arrange them so that they sort of, if they, if for some reason they happen to hit one of these cusp spaces, you can sort of make sure that these are far enough away from the U and from the two points that you want to separate. And if you kind of, usually when you run into problems, all you need to do is just throw on the cusp subgroups and then there's not really a problem. That's sort of the, been the practical way that I've run into this problem, but I couldn't exactly promise you at the moment that, that that's exactly how it would work out. Okay, uh, I see. So, I mean, I was I was thinking about I guess it's the notion of full subgroups. I guess I was I was picturing you know well you're going to try to use these surfaces to to make the cube right. complex and stuff and and that they would always tend to slice in co-dimension one. <laughs> right, and so you um, kind of need to make sure that they don't slice the cusps, or if they do slice, you, you could sort of imagine that if these points are not in those cusps then you can sort of avoid slicing. Here's these two cusps and maybe it slices these cusps, but throwing, there's not really much harm in throwing these cusps on. Yeah, but I mean, wouldn't you want to separate points in the same cusp? You know, isn't this like for every pair? You, uh, you need... Oh, and the other thing is that from a Bowditch boundary perspective, the cusps become a single point. Oh, okay. right. Okay. I see. Okay, thank the you. Cusp, so the cusps sort of become negligible in the Bowditch boundary because they get collapsed to points. 
you have one parabolic point for each cusp in the voltage boundary. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Okay. So um, I guess one other quick conjecture that we're working on since I'm running out of time. Um, one of the things I'm working on with Thomas Eng, who's a postdoc at the Technion, is to sort of build on work of Martin and Steenbach, where they show that sort of if you take a C prime one sixth amalgam of of cubulable groups, then you get something that's cubulable. So what do I mean by that? Um, C prime one sixth free product of uh, relatively geometric groups are relatively cubulable. So if I take some two groups that I have relatively geometric actions for, I take their free product and I throw on some relators. So like each of the relators is, can be represented by a word in the Basser tree of this free product. And then I want them to satisfy some C prime one six condition so that there's not too much overlap between these relator words. Um, then it turns out, hopefully, we hope to be able to prove that you can actually build a relatively geometric cubulation for this particular group. So that would also give you a sort of a wealth of examples of ways that you could build more relatively geometrically cubulable groups. We also hope, so with Groves, we also hope later to show that some analog of Wise's quasi-convex hierarchy theorem will hold, where you can basically just start taking amalgams and HNN extensions over full relatively quasi-convex subgroups, and that you're going to be able to show that they're relatively cubulable. And by that, I mean they act all relatively geometrically on a cat zero cube complex. OK, so let me talk quickly in the last couple of minutes that I have about the, the relative canon conjecture. So. So here's a conjecture. I think the original source of this is in the in a Kapovich problem sheet uh, 57 from AIM. This is circa 2005, if you want to look for it. And let's say GP is a relatively hyperbolic group and say it has free abelian peripherals. And let's suppose as well that um, the Bowditch boundary is going to be spherical. Um, then we claim that this is going to make G Kleinian. Of course, this is a an open problem that a lot of people have looked at. In particular, a lot of people have invested a lot of time in the actual canon conjecture, which is when you remove the word relatively and you turn the Bowditch boundary into the visual boundary, and then you have to change from Kleinian to virtually Kleinian. Um, but one of the things that, that shows up in our short paper that's in Compositio is sort of following the model of Hysinski, who did a hyperbolic version of this, that if we have GP um, with uh, free abelian peripherals, so each of the elements of this collection P is free abelian. Um, and in addition, the Bowditch boundary is S2. Then you can say that, in fact, G is Kleinian if and only if G is going to be relatively cubulable. So that sort of gives you some motivation for why it might be useful to sort of start to try to classify these relatively geometric actions, because it might sort of help you make some inroads on the relative canon conjecture. Um, in particular, there is some work by, I believe, among others, uh, Groves, Manning, Sisto, and there's some other people that I can't name offhand um, who are working on a project to sort of show that many of the cases of the regular canon conjecture can actually be implied from the relative canon conjecture. And the relative, there is some hope that maybe the relative canon conjecture is the right thing to look at because when you're working with these sort of relatively hyperbolic groups, you have a bit more homological room to work around and study these groups. So that's, I guess, maybe one more motivation why relatively geometric 
actions are, are good. And we sort of hope to study them a bit more and kind of develop tools to classify and, and work with them. Um, let's see. I guess I have about one minute, so I should probably stop there and let people ask questions if they like. Um, let's thank Tandy and then ask some questions. So what's the relation between this relative kind of conjecture and the actual kind of conjecture? I thought you can just take the peripherals to be empty and even that just, I thought, is, is it true that the relative version immediately imply the ordinary version? I don't think so. I guess, yeah, that's true. If you take sort of the, I guess, what is it that, well, the relative, so in this relative version, we're specifying specifically that the peripherals are going to be free abelian, right? Okay, so I can't take the collection to yeah, be an empty collection? Or? You, you can't take, well, yeah, I think it's meant to be, you want to take it to be some, at least if you want to think of the relative canon pro conjecture as a distinct problem, you want to think of like having some cusp subgroups there. But sort of, I think some of the ideas that I don't know many of the specifics are is to sort of, explore algebraic versions of drilling and filling to sort of mm -hmm. see, can we go between this, this the conjecture sort of, and then you, know, you can drill out and then have peripheral subgroups okay. that, are, that are going to give you, have actual cusps. Okay. So yeah, I think, I think if you want okay. to think of them as, as distinct problems, you do want to insist that there's like some non-trivial peripheral structure. I see. And then for the last theorem, is it uh, some kind of analog of the Criterion by Markovich? Um, my understanding was that there's a there's some there's a criterion where by Hysinski that's um, okay. That uh, that, that it, you know if you can tell that something is virtually Kleinian if and only if the group admits a cubulation so that it's proper and acts properly and co-compact on a cat zero cube complex. Okay. Let me check. And then the criterion by, uh, but then but the criterion by Markovich, I believe, is like if you have uh, that might be right hyperbolic group where you have enough surface subgroups that separate points on the boundary, then the con uh, then the conjecture is correct. I think that it, it sounds very similar to your definition. Yeah, that's how, of yeah, that's sort of. I think yeah, you're sort of one. There's one step in between where you have to sort of go from having enough subgroups to actually, and then you need to do this. You need to sort of pass that through the uh, Bergeron wise, and then you need to mm -hmm. actually get the cubulation right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, sorry, I should credit, you're right, I should credit Mar Markovich and Hysinski. This is one of the advantages of giving virtual talks is that I can like, you know, quickly zoom through my computer really quickly. <laughs> 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 Other questions? Uh, here's one. Um, I don't uh, think about these things in detail, but but um, intuitively, it would seem to me like the this relative version of the canon conjecture should have a lot less of a chance of being true, right? I mean, okay, it's stronger, but also you know the Bowditch boundary just doesn't see anything about the peripheral subgroups, so like. They themselves could fail to be Kleinian or something, right? I mean, is it not? Uh, 
you know, it's not easy to make some sort of pathological thing where the peripheral subgroups themselves are just automatically disqualified G from being Kleinian. Um, I think in this case, we're insisting that the peripheral subgroups are free abelian. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's the, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you could do some really pathological, if you just, just like said nothing about the peripheral subgroups, okay, you could good, easily good, get good. some really pathological shit and then everything yeah. goes south. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're sort of interested in this case where everything kind of looks like you know, if you were talking about climbing things, you want everything to kind of look like a finite volume hyperbolic three manifold. Okay, but, but what if, you know, could it be that they're free abelian, but just too big or something? If they were free abelian of rank three or something, yeah. then, I know. think, I can't remember why, um, but I think you can show that, the, yeah, you basically want, you can basically insist that if, I think if the Bodish boundary is spherical, there's a reason why you can insist that the peripheral boundaries will act, peripheral subgroups will actually be z squared, but I, I, I have see. to yeah, yeah. reference Maybe, up for you. Okay. It's this bounded parabolic condition or something. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh so. yeah. Maybe there's even like a VCD argument in there somewhere. Yeah, I don't. I do, unfortunately don't remember yeah. the exact argument offhand, but I've, I've sort of had the exact same thought before as to how do you know all the peripherals are actually z squared, and, and my recollection is that the correct answer is that the peripherals are all z squared. Yeah. So yeah, if I if I wanted to, I could save myself the trouble and just say assume the peripherals are z squared, but. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank Teddy again. Thanks. Thanks again for inviting me. It was it was nice to give a talk, especially to give an introductory talk. That's, that was a little bit different. So. <laughs> thank you so much. That was that was good. <laughs> thank you.